Well, thank you very much for fascinating presentations. Um, <clears throat> I was um, thinking that quite a few of the things that we discussed this morning came back in a different way. I, I thought it was very exciting to see how in practice so much attention is now paid to the detailing of the design. Um, and uh, even more so, because in the morning I was uh, lamenting at the lack of um, real data and that the fact that architects and engineers don't seem to be going back to their buildings to study them. And so I was very pleased to hear that all of you um, seem to be going back to the buildings uh, to study them. Um, <clears throat> and in case you needed help, I have about 40 possible helpers here, <laughs> each one of them uh, starting a dissertation project for a Master of Science, a Master of Architecture. And we are not selective about climates because they come from 30 different countries, most inhabitable climates, uh, both north and southern hemisphere. So you have buildings to <laughs> offer, we can take them. Um, now, <clears throat> well, let's see if there are some questions or comments from the audience. I um, think we didn't have enough time in the morning to uh, comment on all of these. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting for me to actually come back and see it from maybe a little bit from Simos, you know, viewpoint. Maybe fr a little bit from the viewpoint of, I think it's okay. A little bit from the viewpoint of Simos, I think. Maybe I. Um, uh, so I was I was wondering you know like about few years maybe five years back, um, and Simos has been critical in this you know kind of <coughs> pushing the agenda of architects you know um, taking a role in analysis and performance you know of buildings, and then there was a very interesting presentation today by Meredith, you know who was on the other side you know an engineer kind of looking at it, and then it was very nice that Hugh came in and you know mentioned a few things <coughs> that we really need specialists. Right, we need we need expertise, you know, of, of a very high degree. Um, so, I in that perspective, you know, is is the is the new agenda, Simos, which you need to kind of tackle changing, because we've kind of accepted the fact that architects will analyze. Simulation analysis is becoming very rather common. Everybody is going to simulate now. Uh, so, is it shifting to the quality, or is it shifting to a different level of collaboration? What do you guys think? <laughs> I think um, in the morning it came up as um, an observation that I put forward that using simulation is actually learning about the principles and similarly uh, going to real buildings and observing how they work and talking to people who inhabit them and finding out how they use the buildings all this becomes quite instructive and, and at the end it could well be that we become like all type architects, that we, we have experience and, uh, and hopefully perhaps that this experience, um, experiential sort of appreciation of buildings uh, can be as helpful as simulation. I think it, it, it was a point made by one of the speakers very recently, who, it, Giovanni, yeah, um, that um, <coughs> pre precisely that that how do you know that simulation is right? And, um, <coughs> well, precisely, especially if it is that you're going to spend a lot of time and perhaps money somehow to, to get the results. You, you can only know it's right uh, by having some experience from before. And uh, when you do have very strong experience from before and you're not innovating at that moment, I'll come back to, I, I, I know that you want to innovate each time, but if there is no major innovation of the sense that performance will be affected dramatically, then you no longer depend on simulation. So I think it's both good to be able to do it and to have done it as a learning process and to be able to go beyond it. But let's see. Anyone else? Or I, I could add a small point to that perhaps, that in the end, a, a simulation, a, a model will always um, a computer will always answer questions 
that you have asked. It will not. It will very rarely, unless you set it up um, willfully uh, to to tell you unexpected things. It will only tell you, in a way, what you already suspect uh, much of the time. And the reason why we we insist on going back and learning from the buildings because every time we go, we find out things that we would have never expected. And uh, and in that sense, reality uh, is a better teacher, although simulations are incredibly useful, and they often do tell you some unexpected things, but, um, and, but mostly they help you visualize things that you already have hunches about. That's my, uh, but, and it definitely helps speed it up. But you know, all these years of, of doing modeling, and in the last few years, I've come to find that actually it's really all about people, um, and that's where we, we, we really need to focus a bit more. So. So is the gap between... So you're talking about some retrospective sort of calibration of your simulation process. Is that because the way you idealize the design to put it into the simulation software was inadequate? Or was the building built differently to the way you designed it? Where, where, where's the error coming in? I mean, it's very interesting. Or is it, are, are there kind of really major assumptions that were not considered? Uh, I mean, if you take the carbon bus project, well, mm -hmm. what, what it exposes is that most of the time our assumptions are incorrect about what ha what's happening in buildings, and, and we're just too lazy, actually, and, and complacent to take them into account. Because if we did, we would have so much more interesting buildings that are so much more resilient and so much more designed to cope with all the things that people actually really do in them. Um, it's a shame to miss out on that opportunity because because we've become lazy and complacent because building services have always said we can provide comfort and it's fine and we never worried about energy bills or we never worried about energy. I think the interesting point, I don't want to hold the conversation, but <laughs> the interesting point about energy is that it's usually invisible, but once you really start noticing it, it exposes lots of things about comfort, it exposes waste that money, so financial evaluations do not bring to the foreground. So. Um, so energy is a helpful starting point in that sense, but there are lots of other starting points. And I think an architect's job is to is to somehow create spaces that take into account of all those take into account all those hidden things that that you know the layperson isn't necessarily aware is affecting their their comfort, their perception, their um, well-being, etc. You know, historically, uh, going back to the 1980s and the first sort of uh, buildings that were monitored intensively uh, here in the UK, um, it was found that differences in energy consumption of six to one of, or even 10 to one were quite common. And, um, <coughs> and, and these were explained by uh, a, 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 a number of things, but essentially because they applied to ex identical buildings, uh, it, they were explained in terms of operational characteristics, essentially of occupancy, you know, and and occupant behavior. And there, there, there was a bit of slight negative implication that you know, if you were one of those people, one of those families that were up, that it, it was a problem. Um, <coughs> but <coughs> coming back to your point, I think that we, our group here, very strongly believes um, <coughs> in the occupant as somebody who must have control of the buildings. The buildings are for them after all. And, 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 <coughs> and it's up to us to, uh, to help them and to serve them. And um, so uh, now on this, I had questions for Kaspar that the, 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 the sort of insatiable drive for innovation, you know, really enthusiastic, um, in incredible. And, 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 and I have two questions resulting from this. One is, how do you convince, how do you persuade clients who are actually quite conservative to innovate? <clears throat> you know, they have to face all glass situations because the client demands it and they can't innovate by saying, no, let's have less glass. And that's one. And then, uh, well, the, the, the second one is a little more critical. How do you know after you've done the innovation that it has actually delivered the goods that you thought it, it had? Yeah, um, 
I mean, uh, research or innovation in, in practice is uh, problematic because we are doing things with uh, quite large budgets and uh, uh, many of our clients is working with us uh, in, in, in one relationship and that's it. So you really have to be very sure to what you deliver and, 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 and what you uh, uh, bid in with. Uh, but well, we found uh, that tried a few times on, on rather big projects to do something like highly uh, radical um, and it, it's just not uh, I mean one thing is you uh, have a, a client that is is, is uh, open-minded but but also uh, there is a certain kind of uh, quality that needs to be uh, proven and you need to have uh, all the different uh, time slots within a building uh, process uh, to um, to live up to so it's it's really hard to do something uh, radical innovation on on an ongoing project uh, so so we try to do this kind of radical innovation in a kind of a, a research uh, project where we have the knowledge on on practice uh, due to our many ongoing projects so when we do like radical innovation we take this kind of a it's more like a, a a test project, so we do like a parallel uh, study, uh, parallel to like an, an, an commercial project. So, so radical innovation we, we do more like theoretically, but we always kind of feed into uh, a, a real life project. Um, the other thing is that you can do this kind of I incremental uh, innovation, uh, where you find parameters that are proven, that are uh, ready to be implemented. Um, in, in those matters, you, you really need to have a good team of uh, people who believe in, in going this direction between the engineers, the client, etc. And the third one is, I don't know, maybe some kind of acupunctural uh, innovation that uh, we tend to do things where we show that it's possible. In it can be light installation or, or, or sculptures or uh, small uh, test projects. And, and then, Clients comes to us and say we want this, and then that's actually really what's pushing. When when you get a client that just has a wish, and he says like you need to deliver this, otherwise, I mean, this is why I came here. And and it's taken some years, but now we actually have three to four projects that are also in in, in rather big uh, commercial volumes where the client really expects us to to deliver uh, innovative solutions, and and then it's some kind of. Uh, then you're in a situation where, where you're being pushed there, and, but you're in it with, with the client and, 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 and the collaboration partners, you find the manufacturers, the engineers. Um, yeah, and, and that's okay. the third one that's really let, pushing. Let, let, let me take further the, the, the question about the occupant that um, uh, Judith just uh, mentioned, that concern for the occupant, and uh, I think the master project also brings things back to the to the occupant. It's it's for the individual whom you want to encourage to use the city, whom you want to encourage to enjoy the buildings in the city through transitions that are relatively smooth, rather than you know the extreme um, thermal shocks that you have now. And um, so, so if we come back to the tower that you were designing, that with a client. Um, <coughs> claims that all glass is needed for um, status, I don't know, for whatever reason, and will not accept any departure. Like I was thinking, why not, why wouldn't the client accept a, a, a continuous trip around? It, it, it looks like all glass from the inside. Um, well, then, what is the punishment that will result from, from this? I think you referred to uh, the... Yeah. The, the sort of absorptive glass that, that they appear to be using in Abu Dhabi, which is terrifying because it increases the cooling load significantly. I mean, it brings the heat straight. It creates a radiator. Um, so, well, you, in, in which way do you think that just doing the, um, the shading of the elevation will solve the problem? I, I, I don't believe that it will solve the problem. And so my um, suggestion would be to find some strategy by which you can talk them out of the old class. <coughs> some comparison, something to do, I would, I would suggest, with the, with the use of the space, like Christian's models there, of where the occupant might 
be able to go and what happens where he or she goes? Uh, <clears throat> I think it depends on the client, uh, but um, one of the ways that we found to be quite effective is when you start counting everything. And so one of the reasons why we went into the embodied carbon analysis um, was it does help you, again, count impact that comes really further down the line. Do you remember the slide where, I, you know, for the, 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 the client who develops for sale is a different client who is an owner occupant, and is a different client who's a, than from, a, from a local authority um, or a government client. And, and the imperatives for all of them are very different. So you have to represent, you have to respond within the, their imperatives. So you, for, the, for the owner and developer, you have to show that, okay, it helps them resell the building. So or so for the sale developer, for the owner occupant, you can you have to demonstrate that whatever you're doing helps with the comfort and the productivity of the workforce. And, and with the local <coughs> government and the government client, you need to show how it helps the, the neighborhood, how it brings value to, to, to an urban infrastructure and urban life. But you would you have to appreciate what the standpoint of a client is, and you know, and sometimes clients don't give a hoot; they just want something that they like. <laughs> and, and you have to work within that, that framework. Um, but count, count everything, and especially count the things that really make a difference. <laughs> Just to help you with these towers, the glass towers in the Middle East, yeah, we, I understand the problem. When you try to explain to the client that you shouldn't be doing a glass building in the Emirates because of energy consumption, it's an interesting one, but a, a, a very complex one, because when you look at this deep land building, the energy consumption, that impact of the perimeter, it's very small compared to the energy consumption that goes all over the building from the circulation strategy to what happens in all these internal spaces and the, you know, and the function of the building, what the occupants do them. How we sell it to the client sometimes is comfort. You know, you put the most valuable resource, you have your human resources, right next to the glass, which is the most uncomfortable place you can put them in that climate. You can have great views, but at the same time, you know, maximize comfort. Forget energy consumption. It's just, yeah, it will, you know, it will impact it somehow. But it's all about comfort. And go with a thermal camera and say, this is the place you would like your most valuable resource <laughs> to sit. And and say, okay, well, what we can do then? And, and hopefully, some of them they will change their mind. It's not easy, but I fully agree with this. Comfort and perhaps even also productivity of your business. And the use of space, because you know, if the area around the glass is considered to have comfort problems and, and you would suffer on that, then in fact you wasted space. So there must be a way of approaching this that shows them that actually the uh, all glass is is is, um, is is less is of less interest to them. Is a loser But let's see. Uh, I'll go up and down and you know you can stop me and uh, down for the microphone. <laughs> Um, I would just like to add a comment on, on the question you asked. Um, I think there's also this, uh, with regards to a glass building for a client in, in a developing country or something, a glass building, I suppose, has some sort of status symbol value. And um, so sometimes, you know, if people haven't actually experienced living or working in a in such a sort of visually appealing and impressive building has to be said iconic um you know it's like their priorities will not be sort of you know it won't be about um going vernacular as you as you were you were mentioning earlier in the morning um i think it's just cultural shifts like maybe you could propose a really really put a really high efficient building in a place and then people live in, live in it and actually love it and actually talk about it rather than, but that would require some, a really bold move on the part of architects, I think.
No, no, you do, of course you do. So the, the whole point about the shading, I'm sorry, I didn't show the one animation. That actually, these shading devices, they open and close. So as the sun tracks around, it's only the strip that's getting the direct solar radiation that's shut. The rest is open. So that's the... I should really show that animation. <laughs> 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 so, But if, if I, sorry, can, can I pick on that? Because I think that's an interesting point. I mean, it's, I mean, at the beginning of the design process, there is a client that has a desire. But I mean, usually it does. They they know that they want something probably that is going to signify modernity, and wealth and comfort. But then that's just a challenge for 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 the architect to produce a, a, a symbolic representation of that. And and it just happens that yeah. there is one that is ready made, which is the glass box. Uh, but but maybe we need to find ways of finding other representation of this, and we need to to find how we can communicate uh, through our buildings what 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 the client wants to communicate, uh, and and but but doesn't necessarily have to be done in that way. I mean, it's just it's just yet another challenge for for stimulating creativity in, on on the formal scale, I guess. Um, although I'm not necessarily, as you see, in the field of energy measuring, um, but I have the feeling that also the question went around this morning of how do you represent a simulation? The simulations themselves, as in now, of course, I think mostly simulations are about reading something off, and uh, we need tons of data to read it off and then visualize it somehow. Um, the curse itself is the simulation, of course. You know, as somebody says, now we've got the tower, and now we, we can show how to make it more. We still want the glass tower. We can simulate to make it less um, energy efficient, for example, because we can. And um, therefore, whatever is measurable becomes sort of the uh, performance that the buildings are being designed to more and more in some ways. Therefore, um, and I mean, if we see also it's just about any scale, and somebody said it today, you said it, what's red in a building is negative. No, you didn't say it. Meredith did. Yeah. Meredith. yeah. So, somebody said it. <laughs> 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 and uh, what's red on a map is a negative thing. Actually, on ours sometimes, red is a very positive thing. And the problem is that we're being indoctrinated so much of reading a certain type of simulation, thinking it's a simulation, yeah? that it becomes uh, uh, the gum tree, the proverbial, yeah? that we've also seen a few times today, the artificial trees. And, um, and I think the question of the um, s simulation, or whatever you want to call it, um, of the occupant is again also a potentially gum tree. Um, in the sense that we're thinking we're knowing something about the occupant now, because we're visualizing his uh, um, thermal environment. I wonder if that's a bit dangerous. Um, it is, of course, positive in some ways. Um, but um, it also <coughs> deflects, possibly, from some meaningful thinking about the architectural space around him and, 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 and planting a building somewhere in the first place. <laughs> but um, we have the problem, as you may have seen from our whatever, they are simulation, but they're not passive in the sense they measure something, they measure it, but they're also trying to, you know, it's something that we don't know if we can actually measure it correctly in some ways, yeah? It's actually not simulating a state, or a simulating state, but it's also simulating a, a choice in some way if you do something, yeah? And if I un then understand, um, it has to interpret, it has to be interpreted not just visually by a color scale, but if I can empathize in the behavior, the behavioral response of the simulation, if you like. And I think that level of empathy can possibly um, then um, give you more insights that are not just a visual reading of something, but uh, almost like, I think it's, it's almost kind of weird to say this, but um, when Yuani Palasma <laughs> talks about how uh, the computer has killed architecture because the you know, the mouse and the simulation is not the same as sort of the embodied knowledge when you draw, say, right? Um, 
I think what we're trying to do a little bit is getting in this direction that we're a little bit more embodying the knowledge that we have about a space that's somewhat not measurable always, you know. But then at that point, the client will go and say, yeah, how can I now prove that this is an added value? But it's just a completely different direction of simulation, you know. And, um, and I'm wondering where maybe simulation, as it is currently discussed, um, as a computerized image um, can be dangerous to ecological um, strategies of design. Can I say something? General Ramble. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's not, I would like to make an analogy for the simulation. It's like when you design a car and your driver is, you know, if the car is good and it's well designed and has certain performance, that's what it is, it's the product. The driver can be a bad driver or a good driver. Uh, so that's the difference. You have to analyze the building in isolation from the occupant and then make a few scenarios. Sensitivity analysis, a very bad occupant, a very good occupant. Is it flexible enough? Who knows what it will happen in the next year, 20 years of the building use? So you can make a lot of assumptions for the occupants. You just have to analyze the product really well, see how flexible it is. It's also and, and, and that's what I believe. Simulation. Can I add one more point about the glass? Because <laughs> <laughs> like, I think we're kidding ourselves a little bit. You know, people choose glass facades because they give you the biggest net area, and that's that it's very simple. You know, you don't have to simulate that. Your net to gross area uh, calculation gives you that that benefit, huge benefit. It means you can rent your building for a lot more money. It's very simple, and you know there are lots of there, we, we, when we did the tall building model, the the study, we compared buildings in uh, in New York and Shanghai and London, and in London people opt for fan coil systems because when you rent space, office space, you don't take into account the plant area or the riser area, whereas in the U.S. all tenants pay for the riser area, and the same in China. And as a result, people have VAV systems as a mainstream system choice. So, so you really, we, we, so what Irene said before, and, and I think others touched on it, that whatever metric you decide to, to choose, it's got its pitfalls. <laughs> um, what, what, so the metrics are tricky. You, you can't, um, it's not good to rely on them. It, you have to rely on common sense <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, to uh, software developers. Uh, it's about the speed of evolving uh, sustainable environmental design computational tools uh, in comparison to other tools. When I'm looking at um, parametric uh, modeling tools or uh, visualization tools, I find that the development is very fast. Uh, new tools every day. Uh, just look at visualization tools, rendering tools. Lots of them. Uh, in comparison, when we move from these tools to uh, simulation tools, uh, we find it's like uh, traveling through to history. Uh, they are um, still not, to me, they're still not on the level of being user-friendly enough to be used easily in the very short conceptual design phase. And however, the uh, Everybody is very interested now in into moving to more sustainable architecture. S I don't know what's happening in the uh, um, commercially. Why why environment? Uh, why developers are? S it seems they must be spending more money or more effort into developing other tools in comparison to simulation tools. What's happening? This is something I want to know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think, um, okay, so the visualization tools are, okay, we have to think about the, the skills of the people doing the development. Okay, so if you go and study computer science and computer graphics, okay, so there's lots of people who do that. And um, it's, I mean, you just got to go to a conference like SIGGRA. I mean, the you'll get a paper, okay, we're taking things quite seriously here. If you go to SIGGRAPH, you'll get a paper from Microsoft Research in how to simulate the combing of nylon fur on a toy bunny. 
Okay. That will be a serious kind of reader. So this, this um, you know, because you know, the games and the animation industry is, mega, you know, instant mega bucks. Okay. Whereas architecture, which is very interesting, is not such a big market for software developers. Okay. So. So there's lots of people, graduates coming out who, who are interested in computer science, interested in computer graphics, and these are relatively now known quantities and people, lots of people there to, to write that software. If you want to do simulation software, you have to not only be a computer scientist with the computer graphics, but you have to know your building physics, you have to know something else. And so there's a kind of um, uh, a step up in terms of acquiring people onto a development team who've got these different skills. <coughs> so uh, there have been, you know, the, the kind of uh, Energy Plus and all the other, you know, these were are really quite historic bits of software written in Fortran. We were just discussing this internally. Um, and so, um, and, and Radiance, thing. Yeah. so a lot of, there's a lot of effort being put into making uh, better user interfaces to these uh, these these bits of software, and and also, um, you know, uh, companies like Autodesk have been ha actually going to Lawrence Berkeley Lab and saying, "Can we help you? You know, speed up your that historic Fortran code." Um, so there is an eff effort, you know, Green Building Studio, things like that, are trying to make uh, these simulation software more accessible. But then I, one of the points that I made um, in my presentation was that uh, um, a, a piece of software embodies conceptual knowledge. Um, and, but it avoids, so the person who wrote the software has to have a lot of conceptual knowledge about uh, the simulation, for example. Um, but why did we put it into a piece of software so somebody else who didn't have that complete conceptual knowledge could have access to it? But that user still has a residual amount of conceptual knowledge that he has to acquire in order to be a good driver of that software. Um, so there is a limit, I think, to how much you can turn a serious subject like energy simulation into a computer game. It's not something which is trivial. If you trivialize it, you make it too visual, too ex if you make, this is a paradox. If you make it too accessible, you attract a incomplete use of it. So it's really, it's really quite difficult. Hence, if you like, coming back full circle to, to this discussion at this kind of institution where you are trying to teach people what it, how to be a good, not only how do we create good simulation software that has this right balance between the embedded sort of conceptual knowledge and the and the, the conceptual knowledge required by the driver, but how to teach the driving strategies. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much what I was trying to say earlier as well, right? Is that currently we use simulations that the ones that are being put on the market, and we learn the scales and the visualizations of them, and we start to interpret building through those. Yeah? Yes. And I'm, I'm just, you know, the question even that was posed before to you, all of us, but you in general, <laughs> maybe more and more specifically, I find the question almost dangerous, you know, to um, why are you software developers not speeding up your development for us, you know, <laughs> as, if, um, as if there's a certain expectation also what your software is meant to be doing, you know, in the sense that I already know what I want from it, yeah, yeah? so in the sense that I'm, I'm not expecting anything, as you were saying earlier, than what I already know somehow, right, my hunch already, and I just want it automated or quick, quickened, sped up through your software, please do that now. <laughs> um, instead of looking at, you know, the real challenge is looking at other ways, of, other ways of thinking about sustainability and ecological design that you have to design, understanding the technology, right? And that is rare, and I haven't really seen that much either today, I have to say, because a lot of the stuff is based on analysis software or, 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 or simulations that exist already in other fields. and. Um, they bring knowledge, like you say, with it, right? They bring visualization accessibility with it that may be borrowed, that may be borrowed from the one who wrote the software, maybe borrowed from another field. But what about understanding how the technology from within somehow and understanding what it can offer rather than just automating what we already know, you know? And that was one of the things I said mm. at the end, you know, the, the, the 
tool should challenge the user, and the user should yeah. challenge the tool. You should not just accept something as a mm. status quo. The whole thing is, yeah. is, is done. And I don't mean what we already know in the sense that, yes, something new will come out. It might challenge our assumption a little bit and some new reading will come out ever so slightly. We we'll have been wrong about by plus minus 20 percent or so. But generally, we anticipated that relationship somehow, right? But we could actually look at things and we try and do that a little bit that we don't know about. Yeah, but we have to know the technology a bit better and not rely, rely on the software developers, you know, <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I just I wanted to ask something else, but it, it's really interesting that we're talking about softwares and and see my personal experience in in the industry, you know, is that simu I mean I think decisions, real design decisions, are really not taken on simulations, okay, and it's it's just visualization, a lot of it, and understanding the problems perhaps, because I find uh, when it comes to uh, a lot of the engineering firms, they still depend on a lot of tables which were kind of published about ten years back. You know, and real engineering, you know, in, in, in sizing the systems, you know, working out the ducts, things like that actually happens, you know, quite independent of all the environmental analysis discussions that happen anywhere else in boardrooms or in colleges like this, you know. So um, that's why I, I really was hoping that Meredith would be here because, um, yeah, I couldn't catch him. But, um, yeah, but I feel that it's, it's, it's totally disconnected. So. And regarding, you know, learning from tools, you know, it depends on, on the level of the user. For example, when I entered this college, you know, and I, I didn't really know anything about environmental design, task simulation taught me lots, you know. And after a point, I, 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 whenever I used to run the same box again and again, I thought it's not really showing me anything new. So, it, so I feel that everybody would simulate, you know, and if, because it depends on the, on, on the user. Simulation has to be free. It has to be accessible. And that, that's the future of it. But it's, it's the real decisions are still somewhere else, I think. Well, simulation isn't simulation, that's the point. I mean, that what you're trying to say is also, you have to design your own, you have, to, if you design, you simulate in some ways, right? And you have to understand what that means. And then technology is not technology anymore, it's your method. For, for example, yeah? I'll give you an example. And then there is no split anymore between his simulation and his design. And that's the problem yeah, I, that we I'm still iterate it. I mean, I just want to give you an example. I've been working with CFD softwares for the last three years now, okay? And if whenever there is a major design decision that has to be taken, you know, and I'm working with um, industry standard software, let, let's say Fluent, you know, for example. Whenever a design decision has to be taken regarding anything, you know, from pressure cladding to anything else, the industry will still depend on, you know, let's say wind tunnel test. Especially in areas where it's been published, you know, kind of CFD softwares are reliable, things can happen. Code recommends physical testing. Pretty much all, you know, um, levels of, you know, kind of comfort, you know, is still being tested by physical models. So, um, so it, it's just that there is a lot of discussion about software today, but in real concrete terms, software is, is just being kind of shown, you know, it's, it's not really making real changes in the industry. That's what I'm saying. It does, slowly, slowly, I disagree. That, you know, we still do the reality check with a wind tunnel or a physical model, but uh, over time, things are getting closer because we understand a little bit more. Like, when you run a wind analysis, all those equations, it's not only one answer. Click the button, you get the CFD, you know, a, an array of arrows, and oh, that's it is. No, it's not. That's going to happen, maybe. But there's so many other solutions to the same equation. You know what I mean? It's tons I, exactly. of, you know, of the equally correct solution. The solution space is very, very big. So, you know, when you simulate one scenario, it's just one of the millions of simul you know, solution space that you can have explored. And when you look at the physical model, you get this reality check, say, okay, that can happen, but also can happen this and this and this and this. And that makes you think. And that makes you innovate as well, because, okay, so how I can predict or how I can... Um, can I suggest that we continue these discussions over a glass of wine? Which, uh, Robert, did you have something can else? I, just, yep. I think at this moment we should all thank Terry for yeah, being yes. the editor of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you to all of our presenters who have taken all of our professionals who have taken this time to spend the day with us. It's really excellent to have everyone here. And thank you to CMOS for helping organize it. Really, it's a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.